We do have this misconception that you have to create constantly all day, every day you write or you paint or whatever your, you know, whatever your medium is, we get these narratives in our minds that we are not something because we think that we have to achieve X, Y, and Z, or we have to produce so much material, or we have to be given a particular accolade. And I just don't think that that's true. And I think those self-limiting beliefs are really they can be very devastating. You don't have to be published to call yourself a writer. You don't have to have an exhibit to call yourself a photographer. As long as you commit to your art in some capacity, you are that thing. Welcome to the Travel Media Lab podcast. I'm your host, Yulia Denisu, an award-winning travel photographer and writer, entrepreneur, community builder, and a firm believer that every one of us can go after the stories we've always wanted to tell with the right support, encouragement, and structure. I'm on a mission to help women's storytellers everywhere break into and thrive in the travel media space. If you're ready to ditch your fears to the side, grow your knowledge and confidence, and publish your travel stories, you're in the right place. Let's go. Ashley Halligan is the founder of Pilgrim Magazine, which was an idea born in the Peruvian Amazon. She's been published in places like Backpacker and Alaska Magazine and worked with outdoor brands like Patagonia and the North Face. Ashley is a skillful storyteller, and our conversation is probably one of the most soulful conversations you'll hear on this podcast. But that's not even why I want you to listen to this episode. I want you to listen to it because somewhere along the way, Ashley does a very, very important thing. She liberates us from the pressure of having to pitch, create, and produce constantly and support ourselves only with our creative work. I'll say this again because I think this is so, so important. In our world, the legitimacy of who gets to call themselves a writer, a photographer, a storyteller, a creator, comes from doing this full time. You're only legitimate if you support yourself with this work 100% of the time. In this episode, Ashley and I break that apart and lift that expectation from our weary shoulders. Ashley is not only the founder of Pilgrim, photographer, writer, storyteller, but she's also a content designer at Instagram and a content strategist for brands. She says, you don't have to be published to call yourself a writer. You don't have to have an exhibit to call yourself a photographer. As long as you commit to your art in some capacity, you are that thing and you can be many things. You don't have to be just a writer to be a writer. And I love that so, so much. Beyond that, we discuss what working with Pilgrim Magazine looks like and why, if you have even the slightest kernel of an idea, you should absolutely pitch Ashley. We also talk about the Portuguese island of Fayal in the Azores and why it's Ashley's favorite place on earth. This episode is one of my favorite episodes to date on our podcast, hands down, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, let's get into it. Dear Ashley, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to catch up with you and interview you today for our Genius Women podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and having this conversation. Me too, me too. And like we were talking just before we started recording, uh, we we connected at the beginning of this year. And I can't believe that it's already been almost a year since then. Like just time is always speeding up. It seems like crazy, crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's the theory of relativity in action. I mean, I feel like the last year has completely melted away. We've been kind of on this cusp of going through this strange spectrum of the pandemic and kind of not being able to move and then having that brief glimpse of time where it was like, things are back to normal. And then suddenly they weren't again. And so I feel like, yeah, this entire year has completely melted away. This and the past, right? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. It's like one big blur. (laughs) It is. It totally is. So I want to jump right in into uh, one of the um, stories that I read on Pilgrim Magazine that I think actually is the reason why Pilgrim Magazine as it is today exists. So I would love to, I would love to hear that. But I read your story called Lost and Found in the Peruvian Amazon. And for our listeners, we will link to it. Uh, Be sure to go and check it out because it's, it's so beautifully written. But what was so striking to me was how vivid 
your storytelling and your writing is. There was a phrase that you had in there called, uh, the, the phrase went something like sloths looking on with a stone gaze as we pass them by. And I literally, like, as I read that, at first I chuckled, of course, but I also like could see those uh, sloths uh, looking at you. And just all the imagery that you put into that story of your experience in the Amazon in Peru, I mean, my God, it's just like it was, it was just so incredible. So you, I think you mentioned somewhere that the idea for Pilgrim started there. So can you tell us more about how that came to be? Yeah, of course. So I think a little more background for Pilgrim. Originally, it started as an outlet for just my own stories. Um, I was doing some freelance work. This was back 2013. So a couple of years before the kind of big epiphany that happened in the Amazon. And so it was more, it was called Contemporary Pilgrim at the time, which is of course my Instagram handle. And so it was contemporarypilgrim.com. And it was a place where I could, you know, write my memoirs, my short essays, my, you know, my travel writing, the stories that I didn't want to sell to other publications because they were so intimate or personal um, that I wanted them to be part of my own brand that I was building. So fast forward to 2015, um, you know, I went to the Amazon for, it was about three weeks. And I had really just stretched the edges of my comfort zone. Like at the time, that was by far the most provocative, challenging, difficult, uh, but beautiful journey I'd ever been on. And so I had been in uh, deep in the Amazon, four hours by boat from Iquitos with an Amazon lodge with an American biologist and his family. And I was there at the beginning of rainy season. So there weren't really other tourists. So it was really me in the jungle and, and a female naturalist that was assigned to me because she knew I was there as a writer. And I really got a really incredible introduction to the Amazon and rainy season. Everything's flooded. You know, everything was green and dangerous and lethal. (laughs) And it was just really fascinating. And so I really had this time to sit with myself and just watch the rain come and go every day, which, you know, it just revealed the most incredible skies and rainbows. And it was just me and the, the kitchen, the chefs that would, you know, put together these beautiful feasts. And even though I was just one of a few people there, they... It was, um, you know, as if they were cooking for an entire party. And so I was just really inspired the entire first, I think it was 10 days that I was there when we were tracking the new monkey species that they thought that they had discovered. So then fast forward to a couple of weeks later when I went um, to a retreat outside of Iquitos and I was there with a shaman and his family. And, you know, what I thought had already been stretched in terms of my comfort zone deep in the Amazon four hours by boat, it was it was pushed even farther in this particular place because I was sleeping alone in a, what's called a tambo in the jungle. And, you know, these moths would get inside of my room that literally had the body mass of small birds. And, you know, I had a net around me, but like everything would hit you with this just like veracity, veracity. And yeah, so I was just alone with everything that made me uncomfortable. And one morning, it was one of my last mornings there. So I must, it must have been close to that three week mark. I was laying in bed, you know, listening to the howler monkeys and just all of the the symphony of the jungle. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, Pilgrim Magazine just came like so clearly. It was like, you know, a, a message from the beyond really. And all of a sudden it just, everything made sense because I know so many incredible storytellers. Um, I know so many incredible people who've had these fantastic journeys that don't consider themselves storytellers. And so all of a sudden, like the idea just transformed. It evolved. I didn't want to be my own outlet. It wasn't ever really intended to be a place just for my own voice. It was more I was trying to create, you know, an ecosystem where people could share really raw narrative stories, but also where I could elevate the voices of people that maybe didn't realize that they were storytellers yet. And so, you know, when you go to a place like the Amazon, the people that you meet are quite fascinating. You know, when you're in a very remote place that takes a lot of a lot of effort to get to, you know, you kind of have you've you've got very interesting people in pockets of the world like this. And so I think at that point, I had met so many colorful people in my travels that I already had a roster of people to pull from. So, you know, in my mind, I'm like this person that I met, you know, in Spain or here in Peru, or these would be incredible stories. And they're not writers, you know, completely different professions. And so it just that morning in the jungle, everything made sense. And so I think I had two more days and I came back to the US and um, really just started, you know, committing so much energy to this project to bringing it to life. Wow, that's such a beautiful story. And your what you said about elevating voices of people who don't necessarily consider themselves storytellers, that resonates with me quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, 
I think some of my favorite stories that we've published with Pilgrim and even some that are in queue that haven't been brought fully to life yet are people that I have found, you know, a lot of them through Instagram, actually. And I read a beautiful caption that's maybe a paragraph. And I'm like, okay, let's create an entire story with this. And I message them and I'm and they're like, we've never written anything. You know, we've never written anything ever. You know, we're not writers. We're this or that. And I'm like, you don't have to be a writer. Like, And I think that that's the most fundamental part of storytelling for me. It's it's that humanity connection and it's enlivening. It's enlivening people to tell their stories and it enhances that connection among people. Oh, yes. It resonates with me so much. That's that's totally what I believe in as well. I think for me, what I always talk about is that telling stories is so natural for us as humans. You know, it's it's such an innate quality. And we do it in different ways, perhaps, right? Somebody is better suited to do that with words, some uh, written words, spoken words, photography, perhaps. But to tell stories, this is so natural to us. And so what I always say is that, you know, if you feel, if you feel some of that, uh, if, you're, if you're unsure, if you have what it takes to tell the story that you want to tell, well, just know that you, you do have what it takes. It's innate to us as humans, you know? So that helps me when I sometimes have those moments of doubt. I think about that, that you know, it's, it's a human nature. I'm a human to most days. And so. And it's necessary for humanity. And I think, you know, particularly in the last couple of decades where we've become so much more digitized. And with that comes the abbreviation of communication. You know, where we speak, um, we don't speak in prose so much anymore everything is edited. It's, you know, it's, I don't want to say superficial, but we lose sometimes that depth of explanation and communication and connectivity, because I think we've, we exist in this ecosystem that is purely digital in many ways. And fast paced, you know, we're all in a hurry, and everyone is busy. And I think when we can uh, divert our attention back to storytelling, and having true human connection, like making eye contact and having a real conversation, you know, that's what I want to reinvigorate again, because I think, you know, so much writing on the internet, too, is, you know, it's, it doesn't have the narrative quality. And of course, I, I understand that there's a time and place for lists and for um, just, you know, get to the point kind of writing. But I think it's that it's that human based memoir focused, just the rawness of telling a story. It doesn't have to be perfect grammar. It doesn't have to have zero mistakes. You know, I've been reading a lot the last couple of months. And what I've really been paying attention to are the nuances of different author voices and how much I appreciate the imperfections, you know, I, or what I consider to be an imperfection as a writer where I'm scanning something and I'm like, oh, like, you know, I, I would have done this differently. Or is there a comma missing? Or it, it's not about perfection, though. It's about rawness. And I think with the digital world, we get so focused on editing and making things perfect and polished. And we kind of take that human quality out and by virtue of doing so that I think I really like to leave the, the raw, rigid edges of things intact because that's what gives a voice its individuality. And that's what we want to preserve. Yeah, so that's so beautiful. And I, and I think it shows up in a lot of the stories that you tell in the magazine, for sure. So how do you go about doing that, right? So you said you had a roster of people that you knew, storytellers or people who you thought would have great stories that didn't necessarily consider themselves storytellers. How do you go about creating something out of nothing? Well, I would say nothing truly begins with nothing like the substance even if it's not material is often so so pronounced that you know I'm so fixated on that that's my focal point like if I see the substance it's there's already so much to work with just from that you know for example you know one of our biggest stories with Pilgrim and one that we published at our launch was the Felicity Buckwinder series and the author of that series um, Jesse she is an incredible photographer so she is a, a storyteller in that sense in the visual way And she's explored, at the time, she had explored some kinds of writing, but she had never really published like a long form story. And really that story was centered on her mother's voice. So we were taking the journal entries of her mother who had passed away when Jesse was a teenager. And so we had just this wealth of imagery of journal entries. And then we had Jesse's voice. And then we had Haley's voice, who was the editor of that piece. And, you know, how do we merge these three things together to create like a cohesive, beautiful story arc? And it took a lot of work and finagling for that one in particular, because there was so much material. But, you know, originally when I was courting Jesse and I was trying to encourage her, like, we really want to publish this. The story is there. I think it was maybe a little overwhelming um, because you know, how do you tell such a big story? And, you know, when you when you don't necessarily consider yourself a writer in a given period of time, 
but it was all there and we knew it was there. It was just a matter of shaping it and finessing it and kind of organizing and a lot of back and forth. I think, I don't know. I think for me, it's really natural to focus on that substance. And then, you know, the writing for me is natural as well. So I can help someone formulate, you know, a piece from even just one line, you know, there was, um, you know, a, a writer whose story we've not published yet. In fact, actually, she's not a professional writer, but she's a, she's a mushroom forager. She's obsessed with mushrooms and she's a traveler and she does kind of the freelance patchwork lifestyle. She does a lot of different things, but not necessarily writing, but she published a caption that was about reading a book in a bookstore in a foreign country, like just skinning or skimming it. And the way that she wrote just these three sentences about that experience, I immediately messaged her and I'm like, let's turn this into a bigger story. And it's become like a work in progress where we're back and forth. So I think it's just a matter of like identifying that that little that thread, that thread that can be woven into like a much more beautiful, bigger tapestry. And, you know, when you see that in someone, it inspires them and it encourages them. And it also causes a lot of reflection, self-reflection where they're like, wow, like I didn't necessarily realize that I this was a story, you know, in itself. And actually a story that we'll be publishing in the next couple of weeks, a similar thing. We found a, a husband and wife or a partner couple, they're, they're traveling photographers. They live on the road. And they had this amazing story about this old man that they found painting a landscape on the side of the road, like in his, you know, old, tattered, rusty camper or camper van, whatever it was. And they wrote one paragraph. And so we worked with them to turn that one paragraph into an entire story that is so touching and so compelling. And it's just a micro moment of the human experience where you're on the road and you share this, you know, it seems like a light conversation. The old man clearly inspired them because they wrote a short caption about him. But I don't think that they saw the the breadth of that piece and how it could grow to become something bigger. And so I think that's what me and Rachel, our current editor with Pilgrim, you know, do with people is we see that fragment or that micro moment that could just, you know, be carved into something larger. And we work with people to bring that to life. God, I love that. And so many questions I already have for you. But first of all, I think this will be really interesting for our listeners to, to hear is how do you know if the story is there or not? Because as our listeners and people in our community, you know, in, in our circle membership and, and, and the class, we, we often talk about, you know, putting pitches together, approaching magazines, and is there a story in here? And sometimes it's really difficult to say if there is a story in here or not. Because it sounds like you have a really great eye or nose or whatever for it. I mean, yeah, honestly, I, you know, I wish that I had a, a, some kind of compelling wisdom to share on that. I think so much. So much of it for me, I feel like is intuition. Um, and it might also be kind of my narrative imagination. You know, I'm really good at creating entire narratives in my head, which can be a blessing and a curse. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I see, you know, something that's so beautiful and just one line, for example, or, you know, you watch a moment unfold. And I, I don't know, like I could create a novel out of nothing. And so I, I'm not, I think that that's just kind of like an intuition based thing for me. I will say I did a few years ago a writing workshop in Zanzibar uh, with a couple of journalists that I think are incredible women. And the focus of this um, this writing workshop was duality of the human experience. So, you know, how we can be two opposite things at a single time or feel completely two different emotions on the spectrum of feeling at a given time. One of the writing exercises that we did was we did a free writing exercise. They would give us a prompt and we didn't have much time. So it was like a very loose, you know, maybe we would end up with 200 words or something. Well, then what we would do, and so of course, that's just, a, that's a framework, right? That's kind of a blueprint. So what we would do later is we would go back and we would add within that, you know, beginning to end that we already wrote, we would expand, 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 expand. And so we would go through what we had already written, which seemed like a very lean, maybe even meaningless piece of prose that we had put together. And then we would create like this beautiful, full, complete story out of it. And by complete, you know, there's not a defined word count that makes something complete. I think a story is complete when it's well told and it completes itself. I don't think that there is a word count that can achieve that. But it was a really interesting exercise for me. And it's something that I've continued to practice since that writing workshop where, you know, as a writer, I think sometimes, you know, you're driving down the road and all of a sudden it's like something comes to your head and you have to like get it out. And so I'll pull over and I'll put something into a note, just keywords. A lot of times my writing is a list. Um, the number of lists that I have from my travels that are just completely random keywords that I know will prompt a larger memory when I go back to revisit that. I kind of use that as the same kind of framework where I go in and it's like, okay, I can expand on all of these keywords. And then you have a complete piece of work. 
And so I think, I think maybe the beauty of observation is what makes something complete. Because if you have that micro moment that you can fixate on, if you can draw recollections of all the things that surrounded that from a sensory perspective, from an awareness perspective, I think presence is what makes a story complete. Because if you're completely disconnected from a moment, you're not going to have all the elements that make it complete. So I think maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the art of being present and having the ability to recollect details because you were so present in a period of time to recognize that there's so much more complexity to a moment. It's not, you know, everything is three-dimensional, four-dimensional, five-dimensional. If we pay attention to the complexity of, yeah, the complexity and the layers of our experiences, I think the stories are endless. Oh, that's such a beautiful advice, I think. And definitely a, a piece of wisdom for our listeners. I I love how you how you said that, you know, if we're able to put ourselves back in that moment or re- recollect that moment through all of the different senses, emotions, experiences, that's what really makes uh, makes story compelling. And I do that too. I, I don't do lists, but I have like these sort of run on sentences, almost like little short phrases of things that, you know, I was thinking about in that moment or things I was noticing. And then, yeah, when you come back to it, you are able to weave that narrative from that skeleton or that structure that you're talking about. That's what it is. You know, I've been entertaining the idea of writing a book of short, kind of creative nonfiction, but short stories, um, because really... I don't know that I have an individual arc to tie them all together. So for me, I think it would be a collection. And so I've been going through, I have just envelopes and folders full of, you know, napkins from a restaurant in France or from, you know, a hike in Nepal where I would just get these ideas and I'm just, you know, pouring out those keywords or those fragments or the run on sentences, like you're saying. And it's fascinating what we don't what we might not think about again if we didn't have that orientation, that piece of material, that artifact to take us back to a moment and then suddenly. It's like, I can't stop writing because I've, I've been able to revisit this moment. And I think it's absolutely incredible what humans can retain. And if you can activate that and you've got a way to kind of, you know, revisit a moment, I think that you're just sitting on treasure that's just waiting, waiting to be told. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. So when somebody sends you, you know, it sounds like, oh, actually, sorry, before we go there, I wanted to comment on one more thing that you said, which I think is also very important. And that's a theme and a thread that's been sort of showing up again and again through all the different interviews that I'm doing with people, which, by the way, for me now as a podcast host, it's so interesting that I can start seeing these parallels because so many women that I'm interviewing, they're all from all over, you know, very different backgrounds, very different stories, but the threads are all the same, which is sort of cool to see, you know. But um, what I was going to say is that The fact that you are reaching out to people who post something on Instagram, post a caption, a little moment, a tiny something, recollection, it just reminds me that we never know who looks at or listens to what we have to say in any given moment. We just have no idea. And so I think it's so important to be able to share what's on your mind, to share your thoughts, share your aspirations. Share your projects. You know, if you you want to work on something, share it with the world. Share it on Instagram. Share it on TikTok in a in a funny dancing video. But we, we just never know. We just never know who sees something that we do, and it sparks. It can spark a really beautiful chain of events that wouldn't never otherwise happen if we didn't share it. You know. So I think that's just something that really strike me from your uh, story of reaching out to people and and doing that. Yeah, and I think too. You know, there's it's that domino effect of humanity as well. And it's like, you know, if you read something, you know, that someone posts that resonates with you in some way, just the inspiration, the domino effect that can come from being inspired or touched, or maybe somebody shares a really difficult life moment, or, you know, they're kind of publicly processing or sharing part of, you know, one of the hard parts of the human experience. I think, you know, there's a there's a really a deep beauty and that willingness to be vulnerable and, you know, where that can lead to. So you can share, you can share the funny, you can share the hilarious, the travel mishaps, the, you know, the profound moment that you had with a stranger or, you know, the heartbreaking, the, the moment that was just, you know, where you're on the grounds crying in tears. Like, I think it's important if you're comfortable, of course, not if you're not comfortable, but like, if you are comfortable, just the impact potential of that is limitless. Yeah, definitely. So I wanted to ask you, as an editor and as a founder of Pilgrim Magazine, what do you look for in stories? So when, you send, when, when people send you emails with ideas, with pitches, 
How do you know if it's a pilgrim story or not? So there's a few things. And, you know, we don't have a formal style guide right now. It's something that we're working on. But I also recognize that we're continually evolving and especially over the last two years with the, the state of the world. But I think, you know, does it make you feel something? You know, does it does it teach you something? Is there like an important human lesson in the material? Yeah, if it connects us to humanity, if it transports us to place in a, in a beautiful, respectful way, we're actually... I don't want to call it a formal rebrand, but we are really focusing on stories that encourage, you know, mindful travel, being respectful of local cultures, of, you know, connecting with a place in a way that honors where it is without, you know, Americanizing everything or having American expectations of everything, Western expectations. And so, you know, those are some things that we're really looking for. So, you know, Anything that's raw and human, you know, there's even silly, you know, like if there's a silly moment that's just hysterical or random or just, you know, sometimes the universe is mischievous and you you end up in these scenarios that are just too comical for words sometimes. You know, one of our stories, it was a, an, a piece about a, a woman in Ireland who found herself at a pub at the end of a very, you know, long, rainy travel day. And these local Irishmen were dissecting a bird within the within the pub because they were they were they were doing an autopsy of I think the bird had died and I kind of forget the entire narrative but it was just such a comical hilarious thing it, there, it's not there was no animal cruelty or anything like that for the record but it was like this moment where this woman just happens upon this place and observes this incredibly ridiculous thing and it's like those moments of just you know comedy where it's just like what in the world is happening and you things that you can't make up so those are some of the things that we look for Yes, that's really interesting. And I think just to just to have a little proud moment here for a second that one of our uh, photographers and writers in our community, in the Genius Women community, Vanessa Dusen, recently uh, published a story with uh, you guys, with Pilgrim, about the Amazigh culture in Morocco. I told Vanessa, we, we had a conversation about it in, in the circle that, you know, this was the story that I wanted to say, to tell for such a long time. Because when I came, when I went to Morocco, I learned, I, I sort of went on the same evolution that Vanessa went where, you know, you hear about Berber, Berber, Berber. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very common term. And then when you go there and you actually meet the people and you spend some time with them, they will tell you, well, no, don't call us Berber, right? Which was the title of your story. We are Amazigh. And they're very proud and the culture is so beautiful. And I pitched that story to National Geographic and <laughs> never went anywhere. That's a bummer. Well, it's funny because it was it was my first pitch, I think, ever. And it was not a good pitch. Like it was It takes time. It definitely does, yes. But you know, that's also why I was so excited. I'm like, Vanessa, you're telling that story that, you know, I, I feel so strongly about. So yeah, just a little a little shout out to Vanessa. And yeah, that story really resonates, especially with kind of that not new direction, but really a focal point that we've got at the moment. And that is like bringing more awareness to, you know, global things and maybe terminology and beliefs that are kind of outdated and explaining why, you know, I, even as a writer, I didn't know that the term Berber was, you know, frowned upon term. I had no idea. In my mind, Berber was always, you know, I would think Berber rugs, Berber textile, Berber, you know, artisan works. And I had no idea. So I'm constantly learning as an editor, you know, especially now having writers from all over the world, uh, new things that are really powerful and important. And Vanessa's piece was gorgeous. And it was also one of our first pieces for a new section that we launched with our relaunch this summer um, called Portraits of Humanity, which is where we're really trying to, you know, do the deep dives on, on humanness. And, you know, some of the stories are lighthearted. Some of them are deeper and have historical and cultural significance like Vanessa's piece does. Um, and some of them are like, you know, more lighthearted and just, you know, they might be more image centered and less about the like less about the long form narrative. Um, another piece that we're working on that's in the same vein that I think is really important as well is um, a writer from Austin who is of Romani background. And she's doing a piece about, you know, the the phrase gypsy and, I, and how that is truly a very racist term, but it's been romanticized, especially in the Western world as a bohemian, traveling, magical um, kind of woman or people. And so she's doing, she's working with a Romani portrait artist, a portrait photographer as well to kind of bring the story to life. So it might be 
some time before it's ready because there's a lot of creative components to this. Um, but it's really important. And I was guilty of using the word gypsy in that same way, that misuse years ago. Um, in fact, recently I did an audit of my own Instagram and went back and changed every caption from, you know, I've been on Instagram for almost 10 years now where I was using that word, misusing it. And without knowing, you know, it's ignorance. And I think it's important to also be very like humble and honest about that, that we're all constantly learning. And I think we're now on this, in this time in the world where it's important to, to be honest about the lessons that we're learning and share them outwardly. And, you know, I recognize that we all have so much to learn. The world is full, millions of cultures, and we can't possibly know everything about all of them. And we don't always know the origin or the history of things. So I think if we can continue to share these stories that teach people to be more responsible travelers and humans and more self-aware and culturally sensitive, I think that that's one of the most you know, impactful and important things that we can do. So more stories like Vanessa's, please. And, you know, you could always pitch us if I know that you, you know, you've traveled extensively and spent so much time, you know, in, you know, Lebanon and places like that, which I, you know, really hope to join one of these journeys soon. Um, I know that you've got a lot of expert insight into some of the struggles that these communities have and some of the misportrayals they have within the news and, you know, just stigmas and things like that. And we want to reverse that. And we want to learn as much as we want to teach. And so that's like a really important part of our ethos. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And that really resonates with me a lot. And I believe you guys have your pitch guidelines out as well submission guidelines. So we'll link to that in the show notes. So if you guys have people who are listening, if you have stories that fit any of the things that Ashley just discussed, just covered, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to Pilgrim Magazine. But I want to sort of jump a little bit. You mentioned Instagram. And I know that you recently also started working as a designer on Instagram. And Congratulations, by the way. That's that's pretty awesome. What I want to talk about a little bit next is this idea that how do you manage all these different things that you mentioned earlier, being a freelancer and, you know, patchwork of projects. There is a sense out there that I uh, sometimes come across that if you're if you're not working solely as a writer, then you're not really a writer. Or if you have some other things that you're working on, then you're not as legit or whatever as you could be. And on this podcast, I actually talk about this often because I believe that that's just BS. And, you know, your path is your path. And however, however your path makes sense is what makes sense. And there is nobody that needs to sort of validate it and say, no, well, you know, you have these other things that you're working on or supporting yourself with. And that means you're not a writer. And I do see this in the industry. And so I just want to talk about that a little bit and sort of find out how you think about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny because I think, you know, so many authors that I love their material, but they weren't, you know, they weren't successful till they were dead. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember that we do have this misconception that, you know, you have to create, you know, constantly all day, every day you write or you paint or whatever your, you know, whatever your medium is. And, you know, you need to be successful at it to be able to call yourself something. And I think imposter syndrome is also a big part of our culture. And I've struggled with it at different times. And, you know, it's funny, I, I don't consider myself a photographer, but I do often shoot my own photos. I love photography. I have a great camera, but I would never call myself a photographer. And sometimes people will introduce me, Ashley's a writer and a photographer, and I correct them. And, you know, I've had other, you know, people that I've looked up to in the industry who will say to me, but you've sold photos and you've been hired to like cover events or to do street photography of a place. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I wouldn't feel comfortable shooting a wedding. And that's kind of always what I say. That's how I caveat it. Um, I wouldn't want to be the person that's responsible for having perfect wedding photos. And, you know, and I've been corrected. Well, so you're not a wedding photographer, like you're kind of a humanity photographer. And it's funny how we get these narratives in our minds that we are not something because we think that we have to achieve X, Y, and Z, or we have to produce so much material, or we have to be given a particular accolade. And I just don't think that that's true. And I think those self-limiting beliefs are really, they can be very devastating. You know, I, I think 
you don't have to be published to call yourself a writer. You don't have to be, you don't have to have an exhibit to call yourself a photographer. I mean, the beauty of being an artist of any kind is that we're constantly evolving our art. And, you know, I look back at some of my early work that I was paid for and it makes me cringe sometimes. And I'm just like, I can't believe I wrote that that way. Or why am I so ellipses happy? I used to use a lot of ellipses. And it's just, it's funny, you know, we are our own harshest critics. And, you know, anyone that tells you otherwise who's within the field, I think that that is motivated by ego. And I think, you know, ego is, you know, it can be the biggest blocker that we have for anything. So I think as long as you commit to your, your art in some capacity, you are that thing. And you can be many things. You don't, you know, you don't have to be just a writer to be a writer. I consider myself lots of different things. And I consider my, there's, there's dreams I have that are not, you know, uh, that are not connected to what I'm doing right now and today that I'm going to eventually be that thing. I want to be a children's book author. I really want to shoot album covers completely random dream I have. And I'm not those things yet, but I I will, I'll become those things because I want those things. And so if you have to have a job in tech or, or not even have to, if you enjoy a job in tech or in any other field and that helps sustain your craft, do that. You know, I could never do my art all day, every day. I just, I, I go through these ebb and flows, these creative waves where sometimes I can't produce anything and I get really hard on myself. And it's like, I have endless material within me that I've not produced on paper yet. So many stories that are unwritten. And sometimes like I catalog those and I inventory them and I think, oh, you're just wasting time. Like all of this time is passing, but it's like you, me personally, people work differently. I can't just sit and write long form constantly. When the wave comes, the creative wave, I have to, I, I commit to it and I ride it and I hibernate and I turn away social invitations. And it's like, I just have to like hunker down and like get the art out because it's calling me and I feel compelled to get it out. And so that's when I produce my best work. When I'm, when I'm bullying myself or, or trying to give myself kind of a ridiculous deadline that's for no good reason, I don't produce my best work. So it's like, you need to foster, you know, some sense of grace for yourself and you are whatever you want to be. You said that you can only produce uh, some of those, some of the best work that you do when that creative wave comes over. And so you can't really create all the time. And I think that's really important because that's something that I talk about on the podcast a lot too, is that we have this insane pressure to produce in our culture. We do, right? right? With Instagram, with TikTok, with all these apps, it's like, it trains us to think that if we're not constantly posting, we're becoming irrelevant. And I think it seeps into our creative work and, and life as well, because we, we feel like we need to do it. But I, I'm so 100% with you on that, that our, our wells need to be restored for some of that yeah. work to be produced. And you can't always just create it. You need to restore. And that, that takes time sometimes. Yeah, there's um I used to doodle the words nourish, replenish, create on on things that I wrote all the time and it was something I when I was editing a magazine in Austin more than a decade ago, it was kind of that was my that was my MO, like as a reminder, nourish, replenish, create. And I think, you know, two thoughts came to mind when you were um talking a second ago and one is that you know, as humans, we have a certain amount of energy at the beginning of every given day and we can spend it in numerous different ways. Maybe it's through hiking, maybe it's through writing, maybe it's through emotional, emotionally exhausting dynamics, you know, in our interpersonal relationships, or maybe a taxing profession that drains you. And so maybe you're only actively doing something a few hours a day, but you find yourself exhausted at the end of the day, and then you're pressuring yourself to create on top of that. And that just creates a really unsustainable cycle. And, you know, something that I struggle with, and I've been trying to become a lot more mindful about is that when things become kind of centerpieces of my to do list, I tend to almost get like this wall of anxiety around them. And even if it's something creative that I want to produce, and I'm excited to write excited to put together, if it lives as too much of a centerpiece within my to do list, or my Google calendar, I almost build a resistance toward doing that thing. So I've tried to kind of take the pressure off of myself to do a certain thing on a certain day, which is a self-imposed deadline and allow it to kind of, you know, come to fruition via more organic ways. And it's that those creative waves that I'm really trying to tap into and exercise when they come and then give myself the the other time, the downtime to replenish, to restore, to do other things that are just good for my soul, you know, and everyone has their own, you know, things that are good for them. And I've just really tried to honor and give myself that space. And it's okay to not produce something for a period of time. You know, as an artist, I think that there's times that we produce a lot, and then there's times that we consume. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot, too. It's like, 
I don't always read and write at the same time. Sometimes I go through periods where I'm just thirsty for books and thirsty for poetry. And then there's times that I don't, you know, I've got piles of books, which are kind of as their own to-do list in a way, which can become daunting. So I've been trying to like move away from that too. But then there's times where all I want to do is just absorb the stories that are on those pages and I don't produce anything and then vice versa. I love that. I love, I love that we're having this conversation. This is something that we recently discussed in the circle. We call it the create restore cycle. Right. And again, that idea that you, you need both, but you, it's a cycle and it's, you know, it needs to be in balance in order for us to be long term, sustainable, committed to this path, you know. And what you talked about earlier, I was inside, I had butterflies and I was just like so happy to hear you say that because I think this is probably one of the most important messages that people will hear on our podcast ever. It's so liberating to know that your path and how you choose to support yourself financially, whatever, what you choose to work on is absolutely valid. And really no one besides yourself gets to determine and define who you are, who you want to be, who you will be in the future. And I just... I loved everything that you said earlier. I will listen to it many times, I'm sure, because even even myself, I, I go through these struggles myself too. You know, I, I also do many different things. And I think you're right to say that it's a combination of ego slash imposter syndrome slash very rigid definitions in society that say, okay, you know, you're not really legit if you're not doing this one thing full time or if you're not successful with it 100% all the time, you know? And so when you were saying all those things, I was just like screaming inside. Yes, so liberating. I love this. I love this. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think, you know, just to add to that too, is I think that there's a stigma around failing or not doing something well. And I mean, fail, fail hard, fail often, fail with passion, and then learn from that failure. You know, I have failed a lot in different ways. And I think that, you know, especially again, I go back to the perfectionism that comes with the digital world where it's easy to kind of present the idea of perfectionism. And so we try to live up to that. And it's just not human. And I think that let's talk about our failures, let's talk about our slip ups, our moments of imperfection, our works of imperfection. And what did we learn from those? How can we elevate that and, you know, take a lesson to improve our work going forward or improve ourselves going forward? And it's okay, you know, there's not there's not an artist in the history of the world that hasn't failed, you know, and again, some of them failed or they thought they were failing until long after they they passed away and then their work became some of the greatest work of all mankind. And so I think, you know, it's important to recognize that, you know, our work matters. Um, we don't have to be award winning. We don't have to have every major byline. We don't have to have editors respond to every pitch. You know, it's, are we proud of our work? Does it honor our soul? Does it reflect like who we are and does it have a positive impact on the world? And I think that's what motivates me more than anything is, you know, it doesn't have to be a Pulitzer Prize. Like it can change one person's course or their life or inspire them. And to me, that's, you know, worth all of the creative investment. Ashley, I needed to hear this today. So thank you. Of course. Thank you for having me. That is so beautiful. That That's really, I, uh, thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about the island of Fayal. It has a special place in your life and in your heart, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. You know, so I was invited a few years ago to join an expedition, a cetacean migration study as a writer. And I almost declined the invitation because I already had plans to travel in Alsace and Switzerland that winter. And then, you know, I, I was familiar with the Azores, but I'd never been there. Uh, but I was already in love with Portugal. And I'd already had this wild dream that someday I wanted to own property on the mainland of Portugal. Um, and I don't know why I've just always felt called to the land. Even before traveling there, I remember saying that I would never skydive again, unless it was in the Algarve, and I'd never even seen the Algarve. And this was like a very young Ashley statement when I was in my, I don't know, I think I was still in college when I would say that. And I don't know why I just always felt drawn to the country. So I started researching, you know, the Azores uh, right before I was leaving for my Switzerland trip. And it just, you know, like a dreamscape. And so I decided to alter the course of my plans and go. And so I, you know, in the winter, it takes a long time to get to the Azores from a place like Switzerland, because there's just few flight paths. And it took me about two and a half or three days to get there from Zurich. And I landed and I had a driver pick me up at the little airport there in Fayel to take me to the guest house that I was going to be staying at. And I took a time lapse 
uh, which isn't something I normally do. Occasionally I take a time lapse, but for some reason I took a time lapse from the moment we started driving until we arrived at the guest house. And I remember just thinking as soon as I saw Pico emerge from, uh, which is the volcano on Pico Island, the tallest Portuguese mountain, uh, as soon as I saw it emerge, it was like I was just captivated. And I thought this is a place I could live. So I was only supposed to be there for three or four days. And I ended up changing my entire travel path. I didn't go back to Switzerland except for to catch my return flight home a couple of weeks later. And I booked the guest house that I was staying at for the for every night that it was free. So I basically that's what determined how long I was staying was how many nights I could stay there in this guest house because it overlooked Pico and the marina. And it had a little writing desk right in the window with, you know, the mountain sitting there. And so I would watch the sunrise. And, you know, it was just such a special place. And one of the things that really drew me there as a storyteller is the the history, because until the 80s, whaling was legal there. And that's not that long ago. So whaling was the the foundation of the economy in Fayel for a very long time. It's also a very important marina in the world because anyone doing a transatlantic crossing generally stops in Fayel because it's got an international marina for provisions, fuel, and it's often the first place that sailors will touch land in between continents. Even the US even the US military stops there to refuel and recharge on the way to the M- Middle East, uh, which is how I know and how I've been to the Azores as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's this fascinating like convergence, history things and culture things, but you know the whaling was outlawed and then now the culture's been replaced by marine research and it's one of the most important marine marine research hubs in the world. And you know, English is the shared language of science and so I was able to communicate with international scientists from all over and just hearing the things that they were studying, you know, the effects of climate change on whale migration patterns, the plastic crisis, you know, deep sea things. And so I I just got this fancy idea that I'm going to move here. And so that was in April of 2019 that I was there, March, April. And so I came back to the United States with this vision and this dream. And I left with my dog in October of 2019 and spent a little over a year there. And as a, again, as a writer, it, and as I formed relationships and met people and made friends and learned more about the research happening and also spending the off season there where there weren't travelers, then entering into the pandemic, you know, it was very much, it was just the local community. And I was able to learn so much about the science happening there, critical science, critical research. I mean, really compelling, amazing things are happening there. and. And the, the old fishermen, the old whalers, you know, a lot of them are still alive. It wasn't outlawed that long ago. So to see how we can move from something that was, you know, economically important, but environmentally devastating into this new phase, there's so many metaphors and symbolism within that transition and evolution of a place. And, you know, the coexisting is fine. Like, it doesn't really feel like there's animosity or anything like, you know, they support they support each other. And so now it's a place that's very protected. The the waters are protected. There's a lot of marine regulations and laws that protect the the marine life there. And it's just, it it became just a fascinating place. The landscapes are gorgeous. The, the, The Portuguese culture there with this kind of international community is gorgeous. And, you know, there's just nothing like seeing Pico every day. Like, you know, the sky can change a million times in a single day there from rainbows to 60 mile per hour winds to clear skies to crazy colored skies. And, you know, there would be whale sharks in the channel, or there would be, you know, a lot of the man wars that would wash up into Porto Pim, which is the beach that I lived on. And it was every day was just captivating there. I remember watching your stories on Instagram about that and just being fascinated by how beautiful uh, that island was. Do you think you will come back there? I hope so. I think in this period of time, it's really hard to plan forward with anything. And, you know, working at Instagram, it's Portugal's not a country I'm allowed to work in. Um, but I do think eventually that I would, I still have the same dream. And there's still people there that I love dearly. And it will always be a home. You know, it's a place that I spent a year in a very strange period of the world. And I think that when we go through a collective, collective crises together, there's an even richer and deeper connection in ways because you experience the different realms of human grief and, but also in the gratitude that you're in a place that's so beautiful and was so protected. You know, they closed our port and our airport for a period of time. And so once the first few cases recovered, you know, we were pretty safe and it's a very, very special place to me. And I miss my daily routine. I miss, you know, dinners at Genuino, the the only Portuguese man to circumnavigate the globe by himself by sailboat. And he's done it twice. And so there's like a, a significant story there. And just, you know, all the other people, everyone there, whether it's a scientist or a sailor, there's just 
more stories that I want to capture and put on paper. So it's a place I'll definitely return. Yeah, I wish a return to Fayal for you, for sure. Thank you. I read somewhere that you said once that we are all mosaic beings. And I love that phrase so much because even, even going back to our earlier conversation about, you know, having all these different projects that we work on and having the freedom and liberation to be able to do that. I think that phrase that, you know, we are comprised of all the different mosaic pieces that make us who we are. I just love that so much. What does that mean for you, that phrase? So that line actually emerged very organically when I was writing a long form story that was kind of a look back at just everything that can happen in a year. And it was a reflection of a particular year in which a lot happened. And there was you know, beauty and triumph. There was deep grief in that year, you know, some really big life lessons. And as I was writing this piece, it was a piece I was having a really hard time finishing. And it was long, it was maybe 4,000 words. So this was a quite a long piece. And um, it was one that I kept missing the deadline on. And I kept asking for a little more time because I just couldn't get the ending there. I, I don't know, I think because there was so much emotion within the story that it was just hard to close it. It was hard to find the right way to end it. And I just had you know, those words just came to me. And, you know, from a metaphor perspective, it just, it means so many things. Like, you know, the the line that followed was something like, we are all fractured by our stories. And I think what I was trying to do was honor, you know, that human experience. Again, I, I keep talking about the human experience, but the human experience is intended to be made up of triumph, of tragedy, of hardships. And I tend to write very honestly about the things that I've gone through. And so in my mind, to be a mosaic being, it you know, gives recognition to all of the different things that are part of that spectrum. It demonstrates that it's still beautiful and that we can, you know, create art from these mosaic pieces. You know, just because something's broken doesn't mean it's broken. Um, and we can recreate and reorganize and reshape. And in fact, I wrote something recently that kind of extended upon the we are all, we are all mosaic beings line. And it was something about you know, looking back again at kind of a strange hard year, we've all struggled in different ways and kind of seeing the difference between being a mosaic and progress, you know, where we're putting shapes and pieces and colors in different ways, determining the pattern, or maybe there is no pattern, maybe it's completely abstract, but recognizing the difference between that and then seeing something as the grout starts being filled in and we start kind of finalizing the things. And it's like, we like the shape that something's taken on. We like the color that the colors that we've put together. And then we start making it a little more final. And I think that that's like representative of the art of creating ourselves and recreating ourselves. And um, I think there's periods where maybe we're kind of all over the place and we don't know how to put the pieces together. And then as we take our lessons and our experiences and we, you know, can kind of shape things in a way that just feels more stable and more more whole if that makes sense oh, so beautiful Ashley you're such a beautiful storyteller I just I just want to keep listening to you <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much that's really beautiful what would you say to someone who feels like they have a story inside or stories inside but for one reason or another that we already discussed you know like imposter syndrome all those other things that tell us we're not a writer we're not mm -hmm. a photographer what would you tell to them? What would you say to that person to try to encourage them to go out and reach out to Pilgrim Magazine, to other magazines, write your stories on your blog? You know, what would you say to them? I would say, um, and I do say, I think it's important to one have an ally. Like, I think having an ally is really, really powerful. I think. There were so many times that I was stifled by my own self-doubt that I just wasn't sure how to move forward. It wasn't it wasn't always so much that I didn't believe in my work or that I didn't have a powerful or compelling story to tell, but maybe I just didn't know the next steps. Like I wasn't experienced enough to, you know, to know what to do next. And so so much of my success has been based on or maybe not based on it's been enlivened by people who believed in me. But in order to have people believe in you, you have to be willing to share part of yourself. You have to be willing to share a little bit of vulnerability, a little glimpse into what you're working on, not feel burdensome by doing that. And I think that was one thing that stifled me as well is that I didn't want to burden people with um, questions or with needing support or asking someone to read my work. And of course, like we, you know, you always want to be respectful of someone's time and have reasonable expectations. But, you know, I'm, I know that because of how much other people invested in me and their willingness to help me, you know, perfect a piece or introduce me to editors or introduce me to, you know, different people that would be 
you know, just powerful additions to my story. I'm willing to do that for other people. You know, like if I see, you know, that promise in someone, and I mean, I think that, you know, evidenced by the fact I launched a publication in which we've got seasoned writers that have written for New York Times and National Geographic, but we also have people who've never written anything beyond maybe a caption. And like, that's what we want. And so I think feel, feel empowered to reach out to someone and just say, hey, I love your work. And I've been inspired because of your work. And I would was wondering if you would be willing to read something or point me in the right direction. You know, it, it, it's asking for help is, I think, necessary, especially in a world in which, you know, sometimes our success is defined by who we know. And that's an unfortunate thing. But like, you, there are so many people who are willing to help. And I would say also, like, you know, I started Contemporary Pilgrim because I didn't want to sell some of my most prized stories to other publications. But because I started that, it gave me a platform. And was I, I made no money from it. It wasn't, you know, it was an art thing for me. This was a production of art. It wasn't monetized. I wasn't earning a living, but it was a place where I, I had a guaranteed home for my voice. And I would encourage other people to do the same. You know, my, my work there wasn't perfect, but it was a place that I could capture and gather all the material from my journeys and from my connections with humans. And, you know, from there it grew and it blossomed. And now it's a community that I don't even have time to write for myself a lot of the times, but I have lots of other writers. So I would encourage people to, if you don't have an outlet, create one, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. And so much of my old writing I've repurposed, you know, I've gone back and, you know, my voice has matured, my writing style has changed some, and I I've gone back and that work has almost become material to build from, you know, like it's kind of in the archives and I can add to it over time or change it or, or pull things from it. And I think as long as you're writing, it's not a wasted exercise or creating whatever you're creating, you know, it's not a wasted exercise. Yeah. Beautiful advice. Um, And I, I, concur to every single word that you said i think it's uh, it's really important to have allies to have support and yeah putting putting your work out there and having a home for it that doesn't depend on the on the whims and ebbs and flows of other people and their platform i think that's a mm-hmm. that's a great great suggestion as well ashley i feel like i could talk to you for another hour i i really really enjoyed hearing what you have to say and again I just want to repeat that you're such a beautiful storyteller and and you have a beautiful way with words and I think we have to have you back on the podcast to (laughs) dig into some of the areas that I didn't even get a chance to to talk about I I sort of wanted to to ask you some some more things Uh, but we'll have to we'll have to have you back if that works for you as well but I wanted to close our conversation with this question that I often ask at the end of each episode And it's sort of a big question, but how would you start thinking about uh, what does it mean to be a woman who is stepping into her brilliance? I think that I think that there's a big emphasis now these days on sisterhood. And I, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot more, you know, material and efforts and retreats and things that are kind of centered on being a woman and on sisterhood and community. And I think that that is a really magical and beautiful thing. I think, you know, it's not always easy to be a woman. And, you know, we face a lot of unique challenges. And a lot of those challenges end up becoming burdensome to us emotionally, because we get caught in the feelings of not feeling enough or not feeling like we have the same kind of trajectory that maybe a man has in different ways. But I think it's supporting other other women. And I think it's being, yeah, like just, I think it's really important to think about the lessons that we are quietly sharing with other women by being willing to be bold and to do things on our own and to tackle big dreams and to have them and to believe in them. And I just think that there's there's lessons, residual lessons that kind of get passed along when a woman who is maybe struggling with her own sense of self or the ability to, you know, just feel empowered in our in our own sense of self. I think the lessons that we share with with those people in that part of their journey are powerful because, you know, it shows them you can do anything and you can, but sometimes we need reminded and we need to have positive female influence around us to kind of remind us so that we remember. So it kind of brings us back to the home of being a woman. And, you know, I think leading, so it's in a way it's leading by example, but we, I think, but we all have to go through kind of those shared female struggles throughout the course of our lives and careers. And, you know, they might be unique in some ways, but I also think that there's a lot of patterns and themes and the challenges that women face. And so I just think once you've established, you know, to some 
to some degree, your sense of boldness and your pride and like you're, you're actually, you know, not pretending anymore. I think it's important to pass that pass that wisdom down and just like empower other women and, you know, show up in a sisterhood in a sense. And I think that doing that enriches your own soul too, in such a beautiful way. You know, that's what I've experienced with, with genius women is that I get so much nourishment from that. It's incredible, you know? Yeah. It's symbiotic. I mean, it, you know, it gives more purpose to, to ourselves as well to like know that we're recontributing in different ways to, you know, help young women or, or help older women who haven't found that, you know, sense of strength and, and, and certainty of self yet. So I just think it's, you know, it's very much a symbiotic relationship, I think. Beautiful, beautiful, Ashley, beautiful conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts and your wisdom and your experiences with us. For our listeners, definitely check out Pilgrim Magazine. We're going to link to it in the show notes. Ashley is also on Instagram at Contemporary Pilgrim, and we're going to link to that as well. Check out everything that Ashley has going on. Check out her stories and don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to share your own stories, your own ideas. You see how amazingly kind and generous Ashley is. So uh, don't be afraid. And yeah, thank you again so much, Ashley. It was wonderful to have you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation and I admire your work so much. And I don't know, especially your role in bringing some awareness and education to some of the places that you take travelers to. And I think that that's incredible. So it's an honor to be here. And yeah, to any of the listeners who are, you know, feel called to share something with Pilgrim, like that door is always open. And, you know, we welcome pitches, ideas, even if they're completely disorganized and not fully formed yet. Like we welcome that. We can, that's what we're here for is to kind of help shape a story. So amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Ashley. And if so, please consider leaving us a review so that more listeners could find our show. I really can't stress how important it is for us to get reviews of our podcast. It really helps us to get in front of more people who might enjoy our show. So if you've been inspired by something you heard today in our conversation with Ashley or in any other episodes of our show, please consider leaving us your review. This is one of the best ways you can support us. Thanks again and stay tuned for an episode on NFTs, non-fungible tokens coming your way next week.